Your Bibles this morning, would you turn to the book of Acts in the New Testament, fifth book in the New Testament. We're going to look at chapter 17 in just a moment, begin reading in verse 5. Please notice the beautiful floral arrangement in front of me. Uh, that is in memory of Billy Crump from his daughter's mother-in-law, Lynette's mother-in-law, Joanne Simpson. And Carol, I was given instruction, take it home with you today and enjoy it. But uh, this is in memory of uh, Billy. Acts chapter 17, we're going to begin in verse 5 in, in just uh, a moment. You know, the great portion of my childhood memories were really great. I had great parents, a secure home. Um, and so as I look back at my childhood, there were very few, hardly any that I can think traumatic events. There was one distinct memory, though, that uh, depresses me even today. It happened when I was in middle school and uh, I had received word early in the week. It was around Halloween and uh, one of my classmates was having a party and she had invited a number of people. And I kept waiting to get an invitation, and I never got the invitation. And if you've ever been there, and I can remember, uh, just as we were yesterday, that uh, it was a Friday night, and uh, I was thinking, I wonder how much fun all of my friends are having. Uh, I'm glad to tell you that uh, uh, I do not have trauma over that. It's not affected my self-image over life. And for Paul Harvey, for those of you who are older will know what I'm saying. Here's the rest of the story. Last week, I was invited to two Super Bowl parties, so uh, I've done that. But you know, we all want to be welcome, don't we? We all want to feel like our person is accepted, what we bring is accepted. I've been on the mission field a number of times. And one of my favorite memories, we were off the southeast coast of Africa, and we were in an area where they had never seen an American before. And we were flying into this particular island, and we got off of the plane, and they put beautiful fresh lays around our necks. They put us in a processional, and we rode, and there were some eight to 10,000 people on the island, and we were in a procession, and we felt like movie stars. They were so excited to see us, and it just was just a feeling that I'll never forget. But there also have been times when I've been on short-term mission trips. In fact, John Parker was with me on one of those where we had to go into a particular town in a clandestine manner. We had to go in in secret. If we had come in in a processional, we probably would have been arrested. And those who worked with us probably also would have been arrested. We went into an area that was really not a favorable area. You know, as we look at Paul, we see this truth in his ministry. Uh, throughout this study of uh, Paul's first missionary journey and his second missionary journey, we have seen that reality lived out. He would go into a particular area along with his team. He would uh, preach the gospel, and there would be people who would readily believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet in that same assembly, there would be those who would reject it. The same message and a different response. Uh, and so as we look today, I want you to look with me because we're going to see today the same truth playing out in both Thessalonica and Berea, that there were people who openly received the gospel message and there were people who resisted it. Look with me at verse 5 of Acts 17. It says, but the Jews became jealous. Why were they jealous? Because Paul and Silas, through the power of the Holy Spirit, had preached and people had believed, a number of leading women, other individuals. But the Jews became jealous and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city, attacking Jason's house. They searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down and they've come here too. And Jason 
Jason has welcomed them. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying there's another king, Jesus. The crowd and city officials who heard these things were upset. After taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of prominent Greek women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowds. Then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we thank you again for the example that we will see in this second missionary journey of a team that was faithful to preach your word. And Father, we're reminded as we see today, there are some people, even today, who upon hearing the word will gladly receive it, yet there will be others who will be indifferent to it or even rebel against it. I pray, Father, that within the sound of my voice, everyone would be in the first group. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, throughout this study and these first two missionary journeys, we could actually say that as far as in regard to his known world, that Paul and the team, they were globetrotters. They had traveled from province to province and city to city. And there were various reasons that they would move. We saw earlier in this study in the second journey that Paul had aspirations to go into Bithynia, but God stopped him. And then there was that Macedonian visit and the man who was calling him to come into this area where we find him today. And so sometimes God was that impetus. He was directly leading them to go into another area. Sometimes, as we'll see today, and we've seen in past studies, that that movement was caused by the rejection of people, by the threat of persecution. Nonetheless, we see that Paul had been on the move. And today we see that he moves from one city, Thessalonica, to another place. Place, uh, Berea. But Paul begins in our study today. He's in Thessalonica. He had just preached the gospel. Uh, individuals had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet in the first verse of our text, we see uh, the antagonism of certain Jews. That when God is working, we can almost guarantee that there will be some type of antagonistic work. Years ago, uh, my mentor in ministry, Ben Lehman, uh, who trained both Karen and me in personal evangelism, he would say, Rick, when you go out to share on a Monday night about Jesus Christ, you can be sure everything during the day Monday is going to go wrong. You're going to lose your keys. You're going to get stranded here. Something's going to happen. You're going to come in the house. You're going to knock on the door. Everything's going to be going well. And then the toddler is going to begin screaming. You can almost expect it. And almost without a doubt, it would happen that way. And so whenever the gospel is moving, you can expect antagonism. And such was the case here in, in Thessalonica. And so Paul had come, he had preached, and then in verse 5 we see that these people were set against him and they sort of solicited the help of shady persons to develop a riot to try to move Paul out of Thessalonica. You know, most of the time when you see riots, whether it's on television or not, if you could interview those involved in the riot, probably 95% of them have no idea why they're rioting. They don't know where it began in the first place because people just have a proclivity toward that. And in this case, uh, the crowd um, began to set against Paul, even what, whatever they knew or didn't know, that's what happened. And so Paul was forced to move to Berea and again he carries out a ministry in Berea and God is working but shortly thereafter antagonistic Jews from Thessalonica it wasn't enough that they could stay in Thessalonica they had to come into Berea and chase them from or at least Paul chase Paul from there so here we have two groups of people listening to the same message yet with differing responses Simply put, one group had set itself against the gospel of Jesus Christ and they would do anything 
to prevent its advance, advancement. The other group openly and gladly and willingly receive the truth of God. And so as we look at it here, why is this happening? It wasn't a matter of the mind. It wasn't a matter of the thought life. It was a matter of the heart. One group had a heart to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. The other group had a heart that was set against it. I wonder today, how is your heart? I want to look at both of these groups today, but I'll be honest, I want to focus on the positive more so. We'll do that toward the end. And we'll ask ourselves these two questions. One's a personal question. Is my heart a heart that gladly receives the instruction God has for me? Now, if you've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's important today that you would have a heart that would desire to repent and believe on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But even as a Christian today, maybe years ago, you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And the question God would have for you today, are you willing and, and gladly desiring to receive what God wants to do in your life now? And then the second question along with it gets beyond just the individual, but this church. Is this a church is this church a church that gladly receives the Word of God, that gladly welcomes the work of the Spirit of God, that delights in seeing God lead this church? Well, first, I want you to look with me at the Jewish antagonists, and it's very clear in verse 5 that they were a jealous group. That's what it says there, but the Jews became jealous. You know, during Jesus' public ministry, he anticipated that he and the disciples would not always be invited. They would not always be welcomed. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. And in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What is he saying in this? Well, we can sort of summarize it in this. He didn't say blessed if they persecute. He said blessed when. Jesus expected adversity. Jesus expected that there would be people who would reject the message, who would actually get to the point of persecuting those who were carrying the message. But he said, in spite of that, rejoice and be glad. And he gives two reasons. First, because your reward is great. Even though you go through the rejection of individuals and the persecutions and the threats, your eternal reward is great. And he adds on, not only that, but you're not alone. He said, because they treated the prophets in the Old Testament in the same way. And so Jesus expected rejection. In Luke chapter 11, he instructed the 70 who he sent out to look for a, a person of peace, a person of influence that uh, would welcome the ministry. But then he said, if you go in uh, to a particular town and they reject you, they do not accept the message, you're not invited, you're not welcomed, then as a sign, wipe the dust off your feet and leave that place. You see, Jesus anticipated that the gospel would not always be welcomed. And then there was this specific instruction near the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6, he said, do not cast your pearls before swine. Now the pearls has to do with that which is valued. And so what is valued? The message like Paul was carrying, it was a precious uh, of eternal value, of eternal life. And so he's saying, don't cast them before swine. Could you imagine taking something as precious as pearls and putting them in, 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 in a pig pen and what the pigs would do for that and do to that. And so he follows after he says that, that you're not to do that, he says, and if you do cast them, they may trample them under the feet. They may take that which is sacred and treat it in, in an unsacred way. And not only that, they may then turn and tear you to pieces. Now that's exactly what we see with Paul. There were those who would take the beautiful message of the gospel and they would set themselves against it. They would reject it. They would put it upon under their feet and not treat it in a way and not, and they would not just stop at that. They would actually persecute the one who would deliver it. So here we are 
some 20 years after Jesus breathed these words, don't cast your pearls before swine. And we see the team is experiencing that. They had been chased. They had been imprisoned unfairly. They had been beaten and they were threatened. And the question follows for you and me. Why would some, in fact, even many today, reject the gospel message? It is a message of good news. I don't know about you. I love good news. If you were to come to my house this afternoon and say, I have some good news for you, and it might be this or that, I wouldn't persecute you. I would gladly receive it. Why are there people today who reject the good news? And the answer is found in one word, control. People want control of their own lives. Listen, the gospel is free. Jesus paid the price, but he calls that if a man or a woman would follow after him, that person must die to self and follow him. You know, people today don't want to hear that they're sinners, but they are. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and not only that, uh, they don't want to hear that only Jesus can fix it. If you want to hit somebody in their pride, uh, find an area where they feel that they're a specialty at and, and go and correct them in it. Then they're not going to take that too kindly. When you say, hey, you're doing it wrong, and then you try to say, and here's the way you do it, that's going to go over like a ton of bricks. And there are many people in pride today who think that they can run their own lives they can't run their own lives. They must admit that they're sinners and that only Jesus can fix it. It takes humility. And these Jews who were jealous, they didn't have humility. I mean, what had Jesus done to them? I mean, he hadn't taken their cookies. Paul didn't do that. But he had stolen their thunder. You see, they wanted control. They wanted to be looked at as those in authority. And this attitude led to jealousy. It led to them to try to protect their own turf. And it led to them directly opposing the gospel. It led them to raise up a group of infidels who would raise up a, a mob that in turn would run and chase this ministry team out of the area. And then it led them not just to stop there, but to go to Berea and try to chase them from that town. You know, there are many people today, and when I say many, I mean many, who possess such a controlling spirit in regard to the gospel. They may not raise up a group. They may not persecute. They may not chase the messenger. They may not bear the rod. Nonetheless, they stand just as strong against the gospel as these individuals in Acts 17. And they say, I will not believe on the Lord. It's most frequently found in the person who stubbornly resists the gospel of Jesus Christ, who when the gospel is shared, they immediately begin to shut out and shut down. It's these who reject, reject the movement of God's spirit in their lives. But listen to what Jesus said. If a person would come after me, and that is Jesus speaking of himself, let that one deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's pretty clear. You cannot today go your own way and go the way of Jesus. It's an impossibility. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't do one and do the other. You can't say, God, I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to do your thing. You're brought to a point of crisis of belief. Will you believe and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? These resistant Jews had already made up their mind. They had dug their, themselves in the sand and said, we will not move. In fact, we'll work against him. They did not relinquish control of their lives to Jesus. And there are many today who are resistant to the gospel. Let me ask you, what are you going to do when you stand before a holy God one day and he asks about your life? Did you humbly confess your sin, repent of your sin? Did you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Every one of us is going to stand as sure as I'm standing here before God to give an account for his or her life about what we've done with Jesus Christ. And do not be mistaken. There will be people 
who would honestly say in that day to their own demise, I wanted control of my own life. I didn't relinquish control of my life to Jesus. Wouldn't you do it today? Wouldn't you relinquish your life to Jesus? Well, let's look at this second group, the Bereans. The Bereans we see, they're picked up here in verse 10. They were those who welcomed the gospel. And it is said really in verse 10 um, that they went to Berea, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Again, we see that frequent place. And it says in verse 11, the people here in Berea were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Now, noble character normally spoke to one's birth. You were born of an illustrious, uh, into an illustrious family, a, a dignified family, a family of note. But here, it speaks not to how one was born. It speaks more to how these individuals responded to what God was saying to them. They were receptive. They were excited. Let me ask you, do you spend time daily in God's Word? Do you open up the Bible and say, God, speak to me? Don't just add to my mental knowledge of the Bible, but God, in this narrative, God, in this direct teaching of the Bible, is there something that I can apply to my life today that I'm readily able to receive and apply? The people of Berea were receptive and interestingly, it seems every place Paul went, there were some people who believed in the gospel. There were some. Every town we've gone, we've seen that. And it was true in Thessalonica. Yet here he says that the people of Berea, in regard to the Bible, in regard to the ministry of the team, they were more noble. They were distinct from that. They welcomed the missionary team. And they welcomed the message. You know, we should desire to be a welcoming church. In fact, as a pastor, there's nothing that could make me more happy than someone to say, your church is a warm and inviting church church. We should desire to be that way. That's why when we're in a worship service, we should not just be thinking about our friends and the people. I know we only get to see sometime once a week, but we're alert to those who are visiting. When someone visits our church, we need to have the mindset this person has not been to this church. They may not know where to go or what to do. And we're more than accommodating, instructing. We help our guests become situated in the sanctuary. Uh, we speak words of welcome. We smile. We try to connect them with others in the fellowship. All of these are ways that we become and are a welcoming church. The church at Berea was a welcoming church, but I want you to see not only did they welcome the persons of the mission team, which is so important, you want to be welcoming of guests, but they welcomed the ministry of the word. They welcomed God. Now look back at the Jews. They were chasing God's message away. What was happening to Berea? Come on, Lord. I want you to speak here. Speak. We're excited. We want to hear. We're, we're not jealous. We know we need to hear it. Let me ask you in the morning when you awaken, and you open the Bible. Is that your attitude? God, I want you to teach me something today. I, w I want something that I can glean, something that I can apply to my, li my life. What about every time we go to a Sunday school lesson or, or we go to uh, a worship service? Are we desiring not just to get a head knowledge, but knowledge that will make a difference? These Bereans were more noble. And it had to do with how they received the word of God, how they received the ministry of God. And I want to look at what characterized them before we close today. But before we do this, let's be clear. Not every church or every area is welcoming to God. Some churches, they welcome people. They welcome uh, the highfalutin preachers that have the millions of dollars. They welcome all of these various things, but they don't welcome God. A few weeks ago, we looked at the miracle of Jesus uh, moving a number of demons from a man in a place called Gadara, and they were cast into pigs, which in turn went off a cliff and died. 
you would think, boy, Jesus was there. The people of Gadara were so excited like the Bereans. They would welcome him. No, they said, get out of our town. Uh, we don't exactly know well, why. It may have been that those farmers had lost a lot of um, uh, their investment. It may have been the fear. We don't know what it was, but they did not want Jesus there. In Matthew chapter 13, in verse 58, we see an indictment on the town of Nazareth, where Jesus spent his growing up years. It said that he could not do many works there because of the unbelief of the people. And then finally, that picture we have in Revelation chapter 3 of that rebellious, indifferent church, Laodicea, in the picture of Jesus standing outside of the door of that church and knocking and knocking. We know that Laodicea, at least at that time, they didn't open the door because what did Laodicea say? We have no need. We have everything. We are rich. We have no need. We're okay spiritually. So we see numbers of cases where Jesus is not welcomed. But I want to look at Berea. And I want to see what describes a receptive person, a receptive area, a receptive church. And so we can look to Berea to find out first, they were a people who adjusted to and centered upon God. They were centered upon God. When the word arrived to them, they did not rebel against it. They said, God speak. If I could paraphrase it, they were saying, God, we are here. We are alert. My mind, my ears, my heart is attuned to you. God speak, I want to hear. There was a desire, there was an excitement in it. They were excited to hear from God. Are you excited to hear from God? Don't say you're excited to hear from God if you never open the Bible. But if you open the Bible in the morning, are you excited? God, what are you gonna show me today? And trust the Holy Spirit will lead you into that truth. So they were excited. Secondly, they were a people who took seriously the Bible and what it demands. In fact, the scripture says here that they received the word with eagerness and they examined the scriptures, not every Sunday, they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They weren't just going to take the word just because someone said it. They would examine it for themselves. Do you realize that there's only one person who can believe for you, and that's you? You must, a preacher can't do it. Uh, a Sunday school teacher can't do it. You must receive the word, examine the word, and believe it. You know, among evangelicals, I saw some statistics this week said 88 percent, only 88 percent of evangelicals believe that the Bible is God's word. Only 55 percent take it literally. And then only 50 percent of people who call themselves evangelicals or born again Christians read the Bible daily. I want you to notice what it says of the Bereans here. They received the word with eagerness. They examined the scriptures daily. They were very serious about what God's word said. But I want you to see a third thing that characterized them as a noble group, a group receptive to what God was doing. They were a people who had a kingdom mindset. Look at verse 13 and verse 14. Here was Paul. He was there. He was carrying out a ministry. People were really excited. They, they were attentive. The word was open. Their eyes were open. Their ears were attuned. Their hearts were receptive. And God was doing great things. But when the Jews from Thessalonica, that same old resistant group, found out the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there to agitating and upsetting the crowds. Then it says this in verse 14. Then the brothers... Who were those brothers? The brothers there in Berea who were believers. Notice what they did. They immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast. But Silas and Timothy stayed on there. What does this tell us? Paul was a marked man more than Silas and Timothy. But I want you to see the heart that the people of uh, Berea had. It would have been so easy to say, Paul, stay here. This is really going well. But you know what? They were concerned about Paul. They knew, knew that he needed to get to, to, to safety. And not just that, they realized that there were more people in more areas that needed to hear 
the gospel. So they kept Silas, they kept Timothy there, but they sent Paul on. You know, a church that is a noble church will not only excitedly receive the word, will not only study that word and, and, pers and personalize that word, but a church that is of noble character like Berea will desire that that word will go beyond its walls. You know, there are a lot of churches, all they're concerned about is what they're concerned about. If it's a ministry out in another country, if it's a ministry out in a community that they don't have control over, they're not interested in that. They're interested in church growth, but not kingdom growth. But I believe as we see here in verse 14, the church at Berea had a love for God's missionary, realized he needed to be protected because there were other areas that he needed to serve. They were a people of noble character. So as we close this morning, the question we have, are we like the church at Berea? I would love that to be said of us. I'd love that to be said of me personally. And, and, and along with that, God has these pearls, the gospel, these treasures. And, he, and he's going to place them somewhere. Would he place them here knowing that they wouldn't be trampled on, that, that what we have that we would treasure, that what we have we, we wouldn't just hold on to for ourselves? Do we pass the test as a church that welcomes God? Are we willing to change? Are we willing to say, God, you're speaking to me individually. You're speaking to us as a church, and this is what we need to do. Do we take the Bible seriously? We can't take the Bible seriously if we're not even reading it. Are we studying it as they did daily, seeking not just to add to our knowledge of it, but God, what are you saying to me? How do I apply what I'm reading today in my life? And are we a church that has a view beyond the walls? Are we just concerned about our own little empire or in the spirit of Berea, are we concerned about the missionary? Are we concerned about the gospel going beyond? If we can answer yes, yes, and yes to those three questions, then we know that God would trust us with the work of his word, with the work of his spirit in this place. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, what we have looked at is very serious. Lord, am I a person that you would cast your sacred treasure, the gospel, to? Is this church a church that can be entrusted with that which is so valuable? Father, may it be that we as individuals in a church would take very seriously, Lord, the ministry of your spirit, the gospel ministry to first believe and then to make disciples. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, maybe.